Hello everybody, tonight we're going to be working on Unit 1. Uh, this is the first real unit in the course. Of course we have a Unit 0, but it's kind of like the introductory thing. And I always like to do that because it's a little bit of a play on like some of the IT concepts that you learn. And also kind of to reinforce the thought that computers, when they start counting, start at 0, not 1. Okay, so I, th I just thought it was kind of fun to do that. All right. These are the topics that I'm hoping to cover tonight before we leave here. Uh, we should be able to get through some of our introductory materials. I hope to create FTP accounts for you if you don't already have them. Um, we will talk about the basic concepts of the web. We've already done some of the first things, syllabus and introductions uh, and expectations. I think we covered that already here in class, but I will give you a lot of other stuff too. Um, we are also going to look at some other things that I think you will find helpful, um, and that is basically some things that you will need to, to work with, so certain software packages that will work for you, um, different basic skills that you should know, uh, and I will point these things out to you because it, in many cases the way a computer is configured out of the box is not ideal for development work. Um, Unfortunately, computer manufacturers kind of dumb things down for the public and we go along willingly because it makes the machines easier to use. But when you're doing development work, you really try to do higher level stuff. So it kind of really, you have to go into a power user mode and I'm going to kind of guide you in that direction. Um, all right, I think this is a, a pretty ambitious list of topics to cover and I'm, I'm hoping that we get through all of them. Um, and I think that maybe a great place to start, you know, I'm tempted to start talking about software and tools, but I think we're first going to talk about what the internet is and how it operates. I know that in your other coursework, um, you know, like if you're an intro net web right now, you're going to see some repeat material, but the material is going to be like a slide or two. You know, I'm not here to lecture you on IP addressing schemes, although, you know, I know all about them, backwards and forwards, because I used to do networking stuff. Uh, but we are going to touch upon it because it, some of that material is pretty foundationally important for the stuff we're going to talk about. So um, why don't I go ahead, I'm going to pause the video here for a second because I realize that the PowerPoint is not shared with you, so I'm going to take a moment to share it with the course. Um, so I'm pausing for a moment. All right, I uploaded the PowerPoint so you guys should be able to see it. Uh, with the topics posting within the unit folder. You should see it right there. If, it, if it's not appearing on your screen, do a refresh and, and you should see it. Uh, so feel free to go ahead and download and open that. Uh, I happen to have it already open on my screen here, so I'm just going to kind of dig in. Um, although I could go into like, you know, the full screen presentation mode, I'm kind of not a huge fan of that when I do PowerPoints because I kind of like to see what's coming up on the next slide. I don't sit at home and rehearse these. Um, all right, so we're looking at Chapter 1, and if you've uh, perused Chapter 1, and I, I hope all of you have the book, um, you'll want to read the chapter, certainly. Uh, you're going to find that our author is a very, very good writer, uh, gives great examples, um, great information, and really one of the better web design books that I've dealt with, especially for introductory material. So uh, I think you'll really like this. So I know it's pricey, uh, but it is well worth the money. The one thing that I do want to point out to you is if you do a really quick search on the textbook and you go to the publisher's website, you're going to see that they have a website that, that goes with the textbook. On this website, you can obtain a lot of resources. Some of them require the code that's on the inside cover of the physical copy of the textbook. Now, the thing I will tell you is, do you need to have these things to do the stuff in the class? No. Right? You can still do all the work. You can type in the code manually. A lot of the code that you see in chapter is in source files that you can download from the publisher's website. So you can go there, download the source code for like chapter 6, and instead of like typing out the examples yourself, you can just open them up and take a look and, and, and work with it. Well, that's not your homework. The homework is different. The homework is something you will have to type out. But they do have the website here. 
Um, and uh, we had a little bit of a discussion also about the the editions of the book. I've had some people in the bookstore uh, go down there and and they got the eighth edition. And when I looked last time, that's what they had on the shelf. Um, and that really, I guess, is the preferred edition. Now they just changed the edition. It's so new that I can't even access an electronic copy myself from my regular sources. Um, so if you end up with the seventh edition, which a couple people in class did, uh, one person actually got it from the bookstore, you will be fine. If there's any notable differences between the stuff that's in the chapter or in the assignments, I will make it known to you. Okay? So seventh edition will work, and truth be told, sixth edition isn't that far off either. Um, but eighth edition is a preferred one. It is pricey, but it is a really good book, and it's loaded with resources. One thing I often do, too, with those publisher websites is I point out what many publishers do is they print something called errata. Do you guys know what that is? Errata is a listing of the errors found in the textbook. Now, this is pretty new, so chances are there's no errata published yet. But if we find something in the book that's wrong, and it happens, right? No, no book is perfect. Um, people make reports to the publisher, and then they create a document, basically, that indicates on page 75, it should say this when, it, when, it should, when we said this, but it should say that. Okay, and keep in mind, so far, there aren't any for this book. But if we encounter them, I'll, I'll make note of it. All right, if you do have the PowerPoint available to you and you're following along, uh, always remember that with PowerPoint, PowerPoint does have this little notes thing here at the bottom, and you can type in your own notes if you like taking electronic notes. The other thing that I would suggest to you is if you are a note taker and just prefer paper, that's fine, but there's a lot of great tools, and I know in the orientation class we talked about tools that you might use to take notes. Um, you know, OneNote, Google Keep, Evernote, you know, there's so many of them. Or you can just create documents, and that is if you choose to take notes. It's not an obligation, uh, but I do see a degree of correlation. Yes, Benjamin? Okay, Benjamin says never mind. <laughs> All right, so let's look at the uh, learning outcomes here for the first uh, chapter. Uh, it's a pretty uh, hefty list of stuff to learn about. I'm making some assumptions that you're coming into this course and that, you know, looking around the room, um, I think that most of you are fairly comfortable with this rudimentary web browser usage, right? In fact, some of you might think that you're relatively expert at it, which you might be. You might be more expert than me. Um, but uh, you will learn about all these different things. So what the heck is the Internet? Uh, the, the way I always like to say it, it's a network of networks, right? This building's got a network. It connects to the outside world, and that network connects to a gazillion others. Um, yes, and it spans the globe. It is absolutely monstrous, and the thing I always tell people is, can you imagine living a life without the Internet? Right? My kids are growing up in a world where they've never known anything but the internet. That might not be the case for all of you. Well, some of the younger people in the room, perhaps, but it certainly wasn't my growing up. And I always joked, like when we were younger, the, the internet for us is we'd pick up the record album and stare at the cover for an hour while the music played. You know? If you're lucky, you had a lyric sheet. That was the internet. And now you watch YouTube and play your video games and read a book and do all this stuff simultaneously. Right? But we grow up in a world that is full of internet. And they have a little chart here that talks about why the internet boomed the way it did. Now the reality about the internet, the internet in its most primitive state was basically launched in 1969. Now those of you in the web development or orientation class, this is going to be repeat for you. But when the internet first had its first connection, which went from uh, Berkeley out to Salt Lake City, two universities connecting to each other. That was right around the same time that man stepped foot on the moon. And then I always posit the question, which is more important in human history? 
certainly at that time, it seemed like landing on the moon was more important. But would you agree with that assessment now? What, what we are contending with, folks, is we are at the dawn of a complete evolution in, you know, human society, thanks to this technology. So if you're like questioning your career path, oh my God, this is just starting. It's not too late. This is just starting. So why did it take off? Well, we had all these different networks that were being developed over time. By the time we got to the early 80s, there were a couple of large networks that were already existing that were interconnected. One was the ARPANET, which is where the original internet connections formed. And then we had the NSF net, which is more on the East Coast. And there were some connections between the networks, but they weren't very good. And right now I find it fascinating. If you watch a show, uh, Halt and Catch Fire, you guys watching that? Anybody? It's on AMC. It's it's about all these computer programmers back in the 80s, basically. And I recommend it. It's pretty entertaining. Uh, but one of their characters is like getting to the point where he's like having this revelation that he should connect these two networks and form an internet. You know, it's like the, this guy's inventing it. But, you know, it's fictionalized. But the truth is, that's kind of what happened. We had all these different networks that weren't really connected to each other in the traditional fashion we're connected in now. In fact, some of the network connections were dial-up believe it or not. Main, the main connections to like these big internet resources. Even on the server side, that was its connection to the l tag world, was a modem. Maybe like 2400 BPS. Something really crazy like that. All right, but what happened is we eventually got to the point where the network started to get interconnected and they came up with an addressing scheme so that you could go from machine to machine to machine. You guys probably have learned some thing about this. Um, but the thing that really kind of opened it up, and this one is really important, where they decided that it's no longer just for government and education and research. Now companies can get into the mix. So now the, the organizations that had a network on site could buy a connection and connect to the network and become basically a node on the internet. They would get their own IP addresses, uh, their own domain names, and all of a sudden you could connect. Big, big step forward. The other big thing that happened is this guy Tim Berners-Lee, and I'm going to play a video about this guy in a little bit. Tim Berners-Lee, unlike Al Gore, who claims, well, he didn't claim that he invented the internet. What, what, what it was is his dad came up with, with uh, the interstate highway system, right? He worked on that. And he wanted, Al Gore wanted to be associated with the internet superhighway, right? He didn't invent anything. He just called it the internet superhighway. But Tim Berners-Lee did a remarkable thing. Because in the early days of the internet, in order to be able to go anywhere on the web, you either needed to know the exact numeric IP address of the machine that you're connecting to in the exact folder where something was located. Keep in mind, no Google. You just had to know where it was. You had to type it in right, and you had to know where it was. Okay, not very friendly, right? And then usually if you went to a particular machine, very often you needed to log into it. It didn't have public resources. So it's kind of tricky to navigate. So what he did is he came up with a piece of software, a browser, that allowed you to basically connect things symbolically to machines. So he came up with a way to develop a link that would take you to the resource so you didn't have to remember how to type in some really complicated address. And because sometimes those resources aren't even necessarily on the same machine, so you can pull a page from here and a page from there and go from one server or location on the web to a different one, with a click of a mouse, in that case the press of a key back then. Um, that was pretty astounding, and he called that the World Wide Web. And you'll see in the video that I played that the reason he calls it that is because he had to figure out a way to talk to all these different machines, and it was like navigating a web, and he didn't know how to you know, go from machine to machine, but he figured out a way to do it. So that's his contribution. He is a huge proponent if you look him up, he's a huge proponent of internet freedom. 
And you guys probably all should be because your livelihoods will, will depend on it. You really don't want it controlled by anybody. Um, but when Tim Berners-Lee was doing this, he was working in uh, environments that were command line. Do you guys know what a command line looks like? Yeah. Now, some of you might not. This is a command line. That was what I had to work with when I started computing. Right? We did exciting things like look at folders. All right, so very, very, very amusing. But the browser that he worked on and the concepts that he worked on worked only in a command line level. So you didn't get like a web page like we see today that was graphical. What we got was this. And text would appear on the screen, and then you could use your arrow key to navigate through and highlight something, and then press the enter key and go somewhere, hopefully, if it worked right. But still, a revolution in terms of internet connectivity because now I didn't have to log into a remote machine. I didn't have to remember the address or write it down on a piece of paper. There was a time when they sold this thing called the Internet Yellow Pages. Not that long ago, you'd buy a book to look up where the websites are. Because you didn't have Google to look them up. It's pretty astounding, right? But now we can pick up our phone and go, OK, Google. And it already knows what we want by the time we type like a letter or two in the search window. All right. But they came up with this product called Mosaic. Now, Mosaic, yeah, see, I, I've got to put in the right ser search terms. So I get all these beautiful patterns. Um, all right. So here's just a really quick uh, little screenshot of Mosaic. Very, very primitive application for looking at web pages. But the difference was that instead of working on a command line, it worked in a windowed environment. So you could be on a Mac or a PC, and you could run a graphical application with a mouse. You can move the mouse around and click on things instead of using your keyboard. Revolution, right? It was invented not too far from here. The University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, I think is what I better say, which is uh, in the middle of the state of Illinois, and the people who developed it were Wisconsinites. How do you like that? Now, the people that developed this piece of software eventually went on to form Netscape, and Netscape eventually became Firefox, which is still around. So, huge, you know, thing that really kind of grew right here out of our our local neighborhood, really. So we have a lot of bright minds in this area. Right, so that was the first graphical browser. Huge, huge step forward. All right, computers became cheap. It was right around that time. You know, okay, where did the World Wide Web start? Technically, by definition, the late 80s, in terms of what Tim Berners-Lee calls the World Wide Web. Um, and graphical browsers really didn't start getting used until the early 90s. You know, and I, I was like in school and just getting into IT at that time. So it was a fascinating time, it really was. Um, right, so computers started getting really cheap. You could buy one, it didn't cost you like $5,000, you know, or $3,000. And if you ever look at like some of the old original computers, you know, old Apples, I still have my old Apple, that cost me almost $3,000 for all the upgrades and stuff that I did to it. Still works, believe it or not. Dueling five and a quarter floppies, no hard drive, 64K of RAM. That was an upgrade. Yeah, this, you know, and the, the monitor was basically a TV monitor, which is, I think, even more fascinating. All right. But then we also started seeing the rise of what they call online service providers. And originally, these service providers were not really truly internet groups. So you had companies like CompuServe and AOL and Prodigy, and I'm trying to think of some of the others. There's, there's a few more, and I tried them all, every single one. And very few of them had an actual portal to the outside world. It was a canned system. You log into the system, and they might have had lots of information. Like, you still use AOL email, right? And they had, like, a whole community and tons of information. But it took a really long time for them to catch on to the fact that they need to open up to the public network 
and that's what they did. Now, the companies that did open up to the public network were smaller bulletin board services that had some features like AOL, but really primitive, but, boy, you got to use a web browser through their service, you got to FTP and Telnet and remote login and all those kind of things, things that you actually connect to remote machines and do something. So real internet connection. That really was happening between like 1990 and 94, that revolution. And that was one of my things, is I, I bought into a SEC PC, which was a Milwaukee area bulletin board service. And I think they might still be around. I don't, I, I think I know some people that still have an exec PC email addresses. But that service became affordable. You know, some of those old services cost like 30 bucks a month. That's a lot of money for back then. Back then you could get cable TV for that price. Um, but that change was huge. All right, so we talked about the graphical browsers really made things a lot easier. If you have the graphical browser, click on the address bar there, type in uh, www or HTTP, press enter, boom, you're somewhere. Believe me, it was not that easy in the old days. In the old days, it was hard to just connect a network card to a computer and actually have it communicate with something. All right, the other thing that happened is we started coming up with standards. So we had this like, public medium for connecting networks, but things were different. We had different types of computer systems connecting to each other, different types of operating systems on the client side, the, the users using the computers, uh, and those standards were set. So in order to be able to really facilitate good communications of any sort, you have to have some sort of standards. So they came up with a few different uh, bodies to help set those standards. And you can see my son's on Steam right there. Those, those gamers watching this video or class here. The one that really became probably the most important uh, one of the standards bodies, uh, at least in terms of what popularized the web, is ICANN. And ICANN has actually been in the news a lot lately. Because what's happened is this traditionally American controlled entity controlled by our government. And the reason it was controlled by our government is because it was affiliated with universities, uh, most notably the University of North Carolina, <laughs> the ones that originally held the keys to this. This organization sets all these different parameters. So you can see domain names, IP addresses, the protocols. I mean, that's pretty important stuff. Now what they're doing at this point in time is the US government is relinquishing control to the nonprofit organization that really runs it. So they won't be overseeing it anymore. Some people are very afraid because they think that it's going to get into the hands of the international community and they're going to ruin it. I don't think it's in anybody's interest to ruin it. And the internet, and the truth is, even though they relinquish control, I'm very much a firm believer that it's still complete control. You're just making it look that way on paper. So I, that's my take on it. Very important organization, though. Take a look at this uh, slide here. It says, the growth of the internet, percentage of global population using the internet. 2010, not that long ago, <laughs> a little more than a quarter of the population of the planet. In five years, pushing on doubling it. Almost double. Well, that's not quite double. But that's pretty huge. How many people are on the planet. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yes, there is a lot of people on the planet. <laughs> Isn't Google partnering with them? Yeah, that's what I heard. <laughs> Yeah, they can't plug us all into the matrix unless we all have an internet connection, so we got to work on that first. <laughs> but this is our, our world population as of August 2016, 7.4 billion people. So if 42% of them are online, that's pretty impressive. 
That's grown significantly in just a few short years. And it should be like, really proof to you guys that the internet revolution is still just happening. It doesn't seem like it here. Because we're probably all walking around with our phone, our tablet, and our laptop, and you're sitting at a desk with a computer. And chances are when you're at home, you're still using all those devices all in tandem, and we just take it for granted. Our TVs are plugged in. Heck, our cars are plugged in. Our refrigerators are plugged in. But that's the United States. We've had the Internet publicly available for quite a long time, and, we, and more importantly, we've had the economic means to have it available. A lot of third world countries, you know what their primary platform is? Their phones, that's why I'm raising it up to be dramatic, right? This is the primary internet mechanism, guess what, globally. And one thing that you're going to discover as we're learning how to code for the web is that we're going to work on these big giant screens, but we have to keep in mind that it's a mobile first world. And all the growth is in mobile. So that's pretty uh, important, the growth. You guys know what an intranet is versus an internet? Yeah. That's correct. <laughs> internal to an organization. And what about the extranet? What well, it says right there. <laughs> I'm hoping you guys can read. All right, next slide. Um, so when they were working on standards, you know, if we're going to write stuff to create web pages, we have to have some rule set to build web pages. And there's this organization called the World Wide Web Consortium. So that's kind of a mouthful. So they say W3, World Wide Web, three Ws. And they are the body that sets the standards for all the languages we're going to learn in this course, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. There are standards for these languages. They're not, there wasn't always the standards. In fact, at one point they were very loose and they were, you know, programming for the web kind of uh, painful, <laughs> honestly. Um, one thing that you should be aware of here is this website. Now, if you look in the resources page of our course show, I do have a link to this, and this is probably one of the more important sites you guys should have uh, at your fingertips whenever you're doing web work. Some of you I, have already talked to me that you already go to this site um, for information. It is an excellent source of information because if you want to code correctly for the web, where would you go but aside from the place that actually sets the standards for it? And not only do they set the standards, but they have all these like really cool tutorials code examples. They even have these little try-it-yourself windows where like one side of the screen you type some code and then you hit the button and it shows up on the other side of the screen. This is actually a great tool for learning how to code the web. You don't need any software, just a computer connected to the internet. So a very useful site, lots of different uh, examples, tutorials, information, um, bookmark this or whatever, just remember to type w3schools.com. If you ever have a question about code and you say, how do I something HTML? Nine times out of ten, you know, one of the first links you get from Google, it will be pointing you here. So very important site, W3schools. One of their big moves of late, aside from uh, just setting the web standards, is working towards what we call an accessible internet. Because when you speak English, right, and you can hear okay, and you can see okay, and you have all your faculties, using the web is no problem, right? What if you're blind? What if you're half blind? Right? What then? You don't get to use the internet? No, you absolutely can use the internet. So, there are devices called like TTY devices. There's even Braille readers that put stuff up on, on the screen. There's screen readers which speak the websites to you. And we're going to learn about all those things. Those are very important. If you're doing certain types of web development work, like if you're making a government website, it has to meet those standards and it has to be accessible to all people. If you're doing a personal website, you know, that's, up, that's up to you. 
Uh, but there are like, good practices for creating content for the web, which makes it accessible to as many users as possible. The book here will point out a lot of that as we go along. And it is an important skill to know. It really is. There's a, a couple of laws that have been passed, and if you guys want to explore these links on the previous slide and this one, please do. Uh, but one of the things that we're going to kind of push you towards is this concept of universal design. It says, design of products and environments to be usable by all people. Now, of course, if you can't see, kind of like, you know, the pictures that you're putting on your website probably don't matter too much. But doesn't mean that you don't want to read an article in the news. But the image, instead of, you know, speaking to you visually, if you're using a screen reader, might say, image of President Obama signing treaty. And that gives you the story. So you can still do stuff to get get the person the idea of what's going on. But the point is, hopefully, that you design universally so that people with all sorts of challenges can view the material. Sounds pretty simple, but sometimes that can be a little bit of a challenge. All right. Is Wikipedia reliable? <laughs> okay, so here's where I'm going to differ from most of your instructors. Absolutely, that's the first place I go to for information. Well, there's times where you have to question it. But it, Wikipedia is actually not a bad source, and I always hate that it gets knocked so much. Would you use it for a source on a research paper? Probably not. Really, any article that you look up on Wikipedia in itself has a bunch of references really should point you to like, where they came from. But for a general piece of information, in fact, I think when I probably looked up the Mosaic browser, let's see, where did that come from? Google's trusting it enough to make it the first result, putting it in a box and everything. So I'm always a little cautious to say it's not good. If I was writing a formal research paper, like a thesis for my PhD or something like that, I wouldn't use Wikipedia as a resource. I would look at the stuff on the page, follow the link, find out where they got it from, and always go to original source. But is the organization credible? Is it recent? Are there links? Yeah, those are all things you should ask when you're looking at web pages. So, do you look up your news stories on Joe's website or CNN? Right? There's a, there's a different level of quality there. And I think you guys are probably aware of that enough that you can work with that. All right. Real quick talk about networks. So, you're... Uh, and again, I'm not trying to give you a networking course, but you guys should know at this point, hopefully you're taking intranet web, um, IT essentials, that kind of stuff, so you're learning some of this basic stuff. Basically, computers are connected together with wires or wirelessly. Um, they connect to devices, then those devices uh, connect to other devices, which then connect us to the cloud, of course. The cloud being kind of this like internet fuzzy thing, it can really have a lot of different meanings. But the internet basically is a, a network of networks. It just connects different networks together. Uh, anything that's publicly accessible is available through that uh, medium. Different types of networks. There's, there's LANs, right? Local area networks like what's in this building. There's wide area networks where we have Gateway's got one, where we have this campus connected to Kenosha, connected to Elkhorn, and all their satellites. So it's not like in one location. It's spread across three different counties. That's a wide area network. There's also MANs. You ever hear of that one? Metropolitan area networks. And I guess gateways might fit into that. Uh, and then there's a PAN. You guys know what that is. Personal area network. You guys use Bluetooth? That's a personal area network. It's a network connection, device to device. Let's give you some ideas. Oops. All right. Actually, they have a link here. I'm going to follow this link. I've seen this before. I'm trying to look at one that's... Oh, uh, this one's fine. I'm not sure how recent this is, but this is an image of, like, the major 
backbone connections of the internet. Now, one thing I want to point out to you as you look at this, and it seems like most of it's here in the States and in Europe. A little bit in China, a little bit in India going on. But in, in terms of the backbone of the internet, the main connection, the, the main wiring, most of it is here. Isn't that weird? We have all these overseas lines that run, and then those countries also have their own networks that are attached to these. But most of it funnels back here to the States. It's actually got a good position to be in, in terms of controlling things. Um, but it doesn't mean that if we cut all the connections that the internet would die, because they have their own networks. But the core backbone, a lot of it is here. I just heard a, a story maybe a month or two ago that they just dropped some new lines uh, across the Atlantic that had some super crazy transfer rates, like measured in multiple terabits per second. Not megabits or gigabits, but terabits. And I was like, trying to wrap my mind around how much the capacity was, and it was just absolutely insane. The amount of data that you could move over that uh, wire, basically. Probably fiber optic. All right, some terminology you guys need to start getting aware of, because uh, we're going to talk a lot, a lot about this stuff. When we work with web pages, all the work that we're going to learn in this class is going to be client-side coding. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript run in the client. The client is the browser. This is something we'll repeat quite a bit. But there's web servers out there, so when you go to your browser, you type in an address, you press enter, it sends out a request to the server saying, hey, I want this web page. The server goes, yep, I got it right here. Here it is. Sends it back to you. Your browser receives it, renders the page in your screen, and you see it. So that's a real basic uh, graphic of how that works. All right. So a web client all right, usually runs a web browser. Web browsers are not the only piece of software that connect to the Internet. And I'm hoping you guys realize that. Um, you will learn in a little bit here, um, maybe after we take our next break, <laughs> that one of the things that we connect with is uh, FTP. And FTP, aside from HTTP, which is what web pages use, is a way for us to move files around from our machine up to the server so that we can get to it on the web. And that's just two of the protocols, HTTP and FTP. There's hundreds of protocols for very specialized devices and, and uses. So there's many different things. Um, web server, that's a machine that that holds the files and it says they're continually connected to the internet and will run some piece of software. Apache is by far the most prevalent piece of software that typically runs on Linux or Unix-based machines. And most of the internet actually runs on Linux and Apache. There's also internet information uh, services, that should say, not server. Hmm, there's a typo. Uh, and that's the Microsoft version of a web uh, server software. And there are a lot of websites that use that as well, typically if they're leveraging other Microsoft technologies. Uh, lots of different stuff that we can push across the Internet. Um, and whenever you see this word mine, it can refer to are you sending a document, are you sending music, an image, uh, etc. Those are all what they mean by mind types, and there's rules for what type of documents or items that you can move around. Those of you that know your networking know that there's internet protocols. Protocols are, in essence, rule sets that we use to inform the agreed upon set of communications. Like, for example, if you were learning how to do Morse code, you'd have to agree that three fast taps is an S, Three slow taps is an O, right? So when we were kids, that was a thing. Nobody uses Morse code anymore except in emergencies. But that's an example of a primitive protocol that you have to have a set of rules set up so you can communicate. The web has got many of those. HTTP is one of them. One that we're going to 
talk about and demonstrate a little bit later is file transfer protocol. That's when we remove files from our machine to a web server and back. That's not a browser, it's just moving files. It's just like copying a file from this machine to a different folder or to a flash drive and just taking it from your machine and putting it on the web. Believe it or not, email is a protocol too. The SMTP, you guys may have done this on your phones or your computers if maybe set up an email account. Usually on your phone, like, what's your SMTP settings? And sometimes if you have a big internet provider, it will automatically set itself because it's not settings. And other times you actually have to look it up. So if you've ever experienced that. But SMTP is for sending mail, pop, oops, pop and IMAP are the ones that are used for uh, receiving email. Uh, each has its own features, and we'll talk about those in a little bit in the course as well. Uh, HTTP, of course, is what the browsers use. You, you probably have seen that. Uh, you don't even think twice about it, that a web address is HTTP colon forward slash forward slash and then some machine name. There's also HTTPS. Do you guys know what the S stands for? Yeah, it, it's for security. So when you see that, where you're entering your credit card information, you're okay. If you don't see it, you're not, and this is what we're talking about right here. See that little S? That indicates a secure connection. Although it doesn't sound like that. I didn't say that out loud, did I? Yes, I did. <laughs> TCP IP is the addressing scheme that sits underneath all of this. You should be learning about it in a networking class. If not, uh, you're just coming into this class cold. I do recommend that you read up on what TCP IP is. An IP address is what is assigned to every single device that's connected to the internet. You need to have an IP address so that traffic knows how to get to it. Um, TCP is, stands for uh, Transmission Control Protocol, and that's at the higher levels of the addressing scheme. That's the space in which applications run and files move around. So IP addresses, so that's like the base level stuff, TCP is the higher level stuff. But they work together as a suite of protocols, and there are literally hundreds of protocols and different types of applications that can run over this scheme. But this is the scheme that runs over the internet. Every little piece of information that runs over the internet, and usually when I teach a physical class, but I'm doing it like uh, video right now, so I can't step up and rip up a piece of paper, but what I would usually do in a class like this is I'd write a message on the piece of paper, and rip it up into pieces, number each one of them, and then just kind of scatter it around the room, and it has to gather back up again and get to its destination, and gets reassembled in pieces, and what's interesting about it is those little pieces don't necessarily all take the same path to get there. They don't, like, go single file. They go wherever they want to go on the internet as long as they get to where they're going. And on the far end, the browser reassembles them, or the, whatever program is using it, and makes it one thing again. That's kind of remarkable, actually, if you think about it. So can you imagine like sending a letter that way? Rip it up and hand it to the postman? No, but when we send information over the internet, things get broken down into what we call packets little pieces, and each packet has some basic information now, like where it came from, where it's going to, what order it should be put in, so that we can reassemble it correctly. Now the reason they do this is because when you rip stuff into little shreds, you can actually utilize your network much more efficiently. Which is one of the reasons why networks won't work as well as they do is because things are broken apart into little packets kind of an astounding technology, really. All right, so we talked about IP. This set sets the rules for addressing. Well, one little thing that they do here, and this is actually worthy of opening. You guys ever hear of, uh, oh, can that be found? All right, so well, I can do this all on my own. And you're networking people. I know I got a couple of you in the class here. You guys are familiar with this already. I'm sure you should be. Uh, there's a thing called trace route, and this is kind of a, a fun thing to do, where you go to a site like this and you type in a web address. Uh, how about we do gateway? Or you can put in a number, too. And what this is doing is it's going out 
and it's looking for where this URL comes from. And what should happen, that is if our firewall allows it, I'm surprised it's taking as long as it's taking, it will trace the traffic from where we are to wherever the website is actually hosted, and we'll show you the path to get there. And if it works well, isn't that interesting? Look at the map. We're not in Colorado going to California, are we? See, what's happening, though, is it's making some hops, they call them, from a couple of uh, routers and access points, and then it's doing a few more hops, and some of them are blocked for security reasons. So Gateway's got things locked down pretty good. Um, but where, where a website is hosted, you would think that Gateway would host a website here internally, right? Or that if you're visiting a site in, I don't know, Europe, that the server's in Europe, where you go to like a website in Thailand, then if you start tracing it back, you'll find that the server's in Florida or something like that. Because that's how the web works, right? Where are the servers? You don't necessarily know. But this is just an example of uh, trace route, and that's what they're trying to show you on the slide. All right. We are going to take a break in just a few minutes. I know you guys are watching the clock. All right. So everything has an IP address. We already talked about that. Uh, something that's more important to us as web developers is the domain name system. So, for example, you see at the very bottom of this slide that we have what we refer to as a domain name, google.com, right? Because there's no way on earth you're going to remember 173.194.1672. Right. And there are machines out on the internet called domain name servers, which will take the name that you type, look it up in a list or database, and go, aha, google.com equals 173, and that's actually what gets you there. So if I actually typed in that address, that's where it would go. But we need domain name servers to do that. And domain names are something that you buy to attribute to your IP address. Some terminology for you. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with URLs, right? That's the thing you type into your address file in the browser. But all, all of those things, including URLs, are actually part of what we call URIs, which is a uniform resource identifier. And it basically, as it says, identifies a resource on the internet, not necessarily a web page, not necessarily a server address. But URLs are part of URLs. All right. Top level domains. And I was just having a conversation about this this morning. A top level domain is basically the last part of a domain name. Dot com. Right? Dot gov. Dot edu. Right? Like your email address. In fact, here, I'm going to go to Wikipedia, the unreliable resource here. And I was just looking at this earlier today. So I went into this link here, and they explain what a top-level domain is. In fact, they have a list of them somewhere. Where are they? I missed it. All right. Let's do it like this. Thank you, Wikipedia. All right, this is yeah, this is the page I was looking at. So, when the internet first started out, these were the top level domains that were available. So, .com that's the one everybody wants to have. That are being increasingly scarce to find. Uh, .org, .net, .int that's kind of a weird one. Uh, .edu, .gov, and .mil and those are the ones that you could buy originally. That, that's it. Then somebody came up with the idea that, well, that's kind of limiting. So why does it, every country on the planet get their own two-letter domain or top-level domain? So every country on the planet has a two-letter domain extension. So if I was in England, let's see if I can scroll really fast with this mouse. 
um, that two-letter domain is UK. For us, it's US. And you might every once in a while see one that's got a dash US here in the United States. But there's some of them, like this one. I bet you you've seen websites that have a dot TV, right? And I'm sure you guys all know where uh, Tuvalu is. It's a little tiny island nation, right? It's got a population probably of like a thousand people or something ridiculous like that. But one of the ways they make their money is by selling their top level domains to people because, hey, a lot of television shows would love to have a dot TV, right? All right, so those are the, the country-based ones. Now, some of those countries also have their own unique languages, right, that aren't like English characters. And for example, you know, I'm, I'm Greek, so I'm drawn immediately to this. In Greek, that's E and L. Epsilon and lambda. So, so in Greece, you know, they don't call it Greece. Greece, we call it Elada. So E, L. But when you type it into a browser, in the latest one, it actually converts it to .gr. So guess what? The web runs on English, folks. People in China who code web pages code in English. You guys have a distinct advantage, right? All right, scrolling down even further, and what's really cool lately is they've basically made it possible that if you have the money, you can actually create a top-level domain any way you want. I don't know what it costs, but I, I know it's pricey. However, there's a bunch that people have developed that now are publicly available for really a pretty reasonable price. And I've been seeing some people building websites now finally getting smart and going with it. Like, for example, some of my students worked on a website for a place called On The Way Cafe. That's the name. They haven't opened up yet. They're just about to open. And they couldn't get onthewaycafe.com, and then they were like, on-the-way-dot, you know, all that kind of stuff, to try to get the name they wanted. And then we finally convinced them, it's like, well, why don't you just get onthewaycafe? And that's what they did, which is pretty cool. And if you start looking through all the things that are available, and this is just a smattering of them, oh my god, you can do just about anything. Right? So why wouldn't you? The reason that most people say they wouldn't is because everybody knows .com. Right? But that's changing. You're going to see a revolution happening where it's like visit our website, um, joes.contractors, or something like that. So you get, you get the point. So the, the web is kind of opened up that way. There's many, many uh, different possibilities. We already talked about this. We talked about the domain name system, right? I'm trying to finish off these slides before we take a break. <laughs> In fact, this is a great place to stop. We'll come back and we'll talk about this. So I'm going to pause the video here and we're going to resume after break. All right, we're back from our break and we're going to look at this next section of the PowerPoints. It's just a few more slides that are left. Uh, but the, what we're about to learn, uh, and we're going to start working with some of it tonight, is HTML. And HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. Now, while this was a language that was designed to build web pages, it didn't come out of thin air. The very first markup language that was out there is something that's called SGML, and that's why you see it on this slide. And what SGML was used for was in the early days of electronic pre-press. So we would have newspapers that instead of hand or machine setting type with a little lead alphabet letters, you know, you'd put them into this thing and you'd put them in a frame and then you'd put ink on it and print to paper. They were starting to come up with ways that people would type up the stories electronically and then they would have to get it ready for print. But here's the problem. So who's going to set all the little letters, right? So they came up with this system called SGML where they could des describe, for example, that this is a heading and this is a bigger font. This part is bold. This is indented. That kind of stuff. So they came up with an electronic language to tell the press how to print the page. And that language is still actually being used. Not as much as it used to be, but it's a language that sparked the idea for HTML. Then HTML came around kind of based on that same sort of approach, where you could set up a document, you can mark something as a paragraph or a heading, 
Uh, you can maybe apply a little bit of styling to it to make it look a certain way. And basically, you're structuring a document using this markup language. Um, and it caught on, obviously, because we're all using browsers now. One of the problems with HTML, at least the old versions of HTML, is it wasn't very strict. So you could write code that isn't quite right, but it still worked. And you can still kind of do that, just so you know. But then when you try to do advanced things with it, things that were programmatic, where you try to actually have it do something instead of just sit there, or if you wanted it to look a very specific way and your code was off, it would break. So they came up with uh, XML to kind of, and it says they're not intended to replace HTML, but to start out with a strict rule set for markup languages. So no longer could you be sloppy with your code, you had to be strict. Now the problem was with HTML, even though it tried to follow XML conventions, it didn't really work because a lot of people didn't know how to code that way. And what will we do now? Break all the web pages that are already broken? we we'll bring down the whole internet? And that's part of one of the reasons why a lot of that bad code actually still kind of works. But once again, if you need to do something very specific, style it a certain way, have it perform a very particular action, it has to have a strict set of rules. Most programming languages, and you guys may have learned some already, have syntax, right? You might have a language that requires a semicolon at the end of a statement, or needs to have brackets around it, or needs to be specified a certain way. It's a strict rule set that we try to adhere to. So what happened was we tried to develop a combination of HTML. They took version 4 of HTML. They applied the strictness of XHTML excuse me, XML, combined it into a language called XHTML, which unbeknownst to most people was actually the standard that most people were using before HTML5 itself became a standard. HTML5 did not become a standard until the beginning of 2014. That's when it became standardized. It was in use before that point in time. But it was that uh, time where W3 the consortium said, okay, this is the official standard, we're going with this. So XHTML was a kind of a way to work around some of the looseness of HTML because you could enforce strictness and therefore write applications for the web that worked and made appearance things like styles actually behave properly. Up until that point in time, and you guys are actually kind of entering into this field now at a very opportune time, really, because, boy, you would write all this code in HTML, and you'd get it to look beautiful in Firefox, and then you'd go to Internet Explorer, and it looked like hell. Or you'd spend hours getting your CSS right in Chrome, and then you move over to Firefox, and nope, it doesn't work. Yeah, well, you know, some of that is kind of ironing itself out, because now even Microsoft's playing by the rules. Yeah. That helps. Because yeah. <laughs> um, they're no longer driving the field like they used to. Yeah. There was a point in time, uh, right around the turn of the millennium, you know, right around 2000, where Microsoft had like 95% of the browser market. So 95% of the people that were looking at the web graphically were using Internet Explorer. A horrible browser back then. It's even gotten to the point now where I brought up Internet Explorer the other day, and we'll see if it does it. Okay, well, it didn't do it. It's kind of waiting for the default Microsoft page to kick in. But what basically what it tried to do is it put up a message on the screen saying, you might want to consider using Edge. Internet Explorer is kind of being phased out. So this is Microsoft saying that. And that, that's really kind of the case. Now, it does not necessarily mean it's a completely obsolete browser. There's a lot of reasons why it's still used. All right. HTML5, that's where we are now. And now that the browsers are playing by the rules, because we actually have rules to play by, things are getting much easier to code for the web, provided you follow the rule sets that are set. So you can create stuff that will look the same in all the browsers if you follow the rules and specific conventions. And that's what we're going to teach you how to do. We already talked about W3, right? And what do we use the web for? All of these things. 
I'm not going to talk about all of them. I think that you guys are probably attuned to many of these things already. All right, that ends the chapter one lecture. Uh, this video will end here, and then we will move into doing some other stuff, and I will also record that, but it will be in a separate video. All right, chapter one video.